It does mean, however, that we're responsible, to your point, just for being intentional, really intentional about the, the leadership voice that I'm choosing to use here and the leadership voice I'm choosing to use here. That, that choosing in and of itself is an act of leadership, right? That, that intentionality is an act of leadership. Just being on purpose about my audience <laughs> uh, it is an act of being a leader. And if you do that. Hello, and welcome to the Coaching Studio. I'm Lisa DeHart, your host today, and I am delighted to have Mark Hunter, MCC with the International Coaching Federation in the studio today. Mark is not only an expert executive coach, but also the author of The Brink, How Great Leadership is Invented. With an impressive 28 years in the global arena, he is the mastermind behind Pinnacle Coaching, where he focuses on cultivating leadership, steering through crisis, and sparking organizational innovation. Mark is known for transforming fear and uncertainty into strategic advantages. He is a mentor to a new wave of coaches and reshaping leadership in various sectors. And for a fun fact, Mark is a level three snowboard instructor. Pretty cool. So giving a warm welcome to Mark Hunter. Mark, welcome to the studio. Have you here. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. And so I just, um, I, I mean, you have such a varied background when I was reading about you, economics, mathematics, Patty certified, snowboard certified. You're a, quite a man of many talents. And I'm really curious, what, what was sort of the thing that that drift brought you, drifted is not the right word, but had you dive into coaching in your career like how did you end up here yeah I mean it was a it was a relatively acute experience I uh I had uh done everything I'd wanted to do I wanted to go work in finance I wanted to go work in uh in 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 corporate America and I was a math and economics major I was working in uh in the reinsurance industry as a risk analyst and I as an underwriter and I found that I was not happy I, I you know, pretty quickly in my early 20s realized that the, the path wasn't working for me. So I hired a coach. And back in the early 90s, that was a, not, a, not as obvious a choice uh, it was suggested to me. And so uh, upon hiring him, I had a pretty, pretty early on in our engagement, I had a conversation with him that really changed uh, my path quite significantly. He asked me, um, what do you want? <laughs> Which is a, a pretty... <laughs> A pretty Such innocuous a question. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pretty innocuous question. Uh, but unlike what most people do when they ask that question, they they ask the question and they typically allow the the responder to uh, to to respond with something, and then they let them off the hook. Well, he didn't let me off the hook, and so I I answered with something um, rote, like oh, I want the next promotion, I want the next bonus, I want something, and he said, okay, well, why? And and I said, well, you know, it just seems like it's the next step in my career. And he's like, okay, but why? And he wouldn't let me go with sort of the canned responses that I'd gotten away with up till then. And I was fascinated by two things. First of all, that I didn't have an answer to this very simple question <laughs> really bothered me. But also that he, the way he was about it wasn't accusatory. It wasn't shaming. It wasn't, uh, he wasn't condescending about it. He really was genuinely curious about my curiosity or lack thereof. <laughs> and I, I and I got fascinated by both of those those situations that I didn't know the answer and that he kept asking and was really genuinely curious about it. And I uh, I really got in that moment fascinated by what he was doing. And I wanted to, I think that was the spark. I want to do what he was doing and make a difference in people's lives from that place and difference in organizations from that mm -hmm. place and teams and and leadership sort of on a, on a more global level from that, that place of that curiosity and not letting us and ourselves off the hook uh, with the sort of rote answers that we usually give. And so that, that really changed my trajectory. I think I initially engaged him because I wanted to, uh, you know, sort of get back on track with my career and, you know, get Maybe I'll like it more. <laughs> help, help me like this again. <clears throat> and what I ended up discovering was I liked what he did more than I liked what I was doing. And the rest was history. I, I think within six months, I left what I was doing and became a uh, an apprentice of his uh, in his company and started building my practice slowly over time. And, and here we are 28 years later. 
Wow. Isn't that amazing? You know, it's so, two things really show up as you say that. And the first thing is just the amazing power of somebody holding space for another person. And, and, and like you said, not letting you off the hook with your rote answers and actually the awareness of, I don't even have an answer to this fundamentally simple question. Yeah. I, I mean, and how, I mean, I would assume I'm guessing here. So please correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm assuming you found the answer along the way. I really did. <laughs> and, I, and I found it and I'm I'm currently doing it for a career now, but it's, uh, it's really helping people um, sort of hold that sim a similar mirror up to themselves or to their teams, to their organizations, and to see what they want and how what they're perhaps doing isn't in line with what they want, uh, mm -hmm. behaviorally, um, structurally, systemically, tactically. Uh, and, and really, this, this, for me, lived inside of a leadership conversation. You know, for me, that really, that really spoke to what real leaders do. You know, I think about, I thought about the leaders that I respected and emulated at the time. And, uh, and they were experts at really aligning those things in their lives. And that was great. And I really wanted to help people do that for themselves um, and for their organizations and their teams. And so that's, that, that really is what had me be able to answer my own question. And, and uh, it was struggling with it myself. <laughs> I think, well, and I think that speaks to, it is really difficult to hold the space for a question you haven't actually wrestled with. Yes, absolutely. And and to have somebody gently yet firmly <laughs> um, hold you to having a response that's that's authentic uh, really made all the difference for me in that in that case. Yeah, yeah that's brilliant. And so, I mean, 28 years now of being in this this world of coaching and holding the space for other people. What are the things that you believe you've learned about yourself in this process? <laughs> wow. I've got a, quite a list of things I've learned about myself. Uh, one of the things is that uh, I'm going to uh, I'm going to be continuing to learn <laughs> over time. I am not done and will not be. Um, but one of the things that I think I've learned that I'm most proud of is is um, is 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 that I'm courageous. You know, I think there was uh, there was a lot of safety and comfort in the career choice I'd made. Uh, you know, the trajectory ahead of me was clear. I was on the path and I was doing very well in it and it felt safe. And what I noticed was that that safety was part of what I didn't like about it. And so, you know, th there was something about uh, about building my own coaching practice and, and being out on my own and being the master of my own destiny that that I was attracted to. I think one of the things that was most attractive about it was that it 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 drove up a bit of fear. Mm -hmm. And I had been doing the safe route for quite some time and and I think the fear and the 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 sort of facing the unknown and being at the helm of that uh really spoke to me. And so you know one of the things that that same coach challenged me around was if you're if you're doing anything if you go to 20, if you go 24 to 48 hours without doing something that scares you, go find something that's going to challenge you and get you outside your comfort zone. And he really started to see that that was something I needed and that muscle got built over time. And so mm -hmm. that I'm courageous and that I'm, I, I want to be putting myself outside my comfort zone is something I learned about mm -hmm. myself really um, and proud of. And I think another thing though, is that there's a, you know, there's an adventurer in me. I, I traveled a lot, all those things you talked about uh, <laughs> yeah. me doing. I'm a certified rescue diver. I'm a, you know, I was a certified rescue diver and I, and a certified snowboard instructor and all these things. And that, that, that sense of adventure never left. I think there's a, a different way of adventuring that I bring into my practice with my work with my clients. Um, but it's an exploration that's a lot more uh, inward facing. Uh, than than it is involving uh, trains and planes now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I and I think it's true that in the sense of like when I was looking at all the things that you were certified to do and and how you were getting out into the world when you weren't coaching. Clearly, you were getting out into the world in a really kind of adventuresome way. And I mean, you were smart also to get certification so you could do it probably a little more safely. But I mean. 
but there's there's something about that energy of adventure so miss i'm not sure that's a word but i like it um so and and i think there's a, a correlation i'm not exactly sure how you see it i'd love to hear this but the correlation between that courage and that adventuresome quality and the entrepreneurial building a business like how because I hear from a lot of coaches and you probably do too. Like, how are you going to build it? How do I build a business? How am I going to do this? What is the, right? Like all of that sort of stuff. And I mean, and it just makes me think like, how, how do you, how do you make that correlation for yourself between that courage and also what you're able to do in your own business? Yeah. Well, well, I mean, it's a great question. What you're talking about when you use the word adventurousness, <laughs> um, adventuring, um, is really for me it became about being an explorer. Um, I, I traveled for a year, uh, didn't and didn't have a an itinerary for that year. I I traveled globally and really wanted to sort of see the world and and be out with people and meet people from different backgrounds and different experiences and different outlooks on life and death. Uh, and everything in between. And that exploration uh, is the exact same type of exploration, contextually at least, uh, that I do with clients and with myself, with my own coach, <laughs> um, really searching out the unknown, looking at other voices, listening to um, to myself and to others from different perspectives, and being genuinely curious. You know, curiosity is a, a funny thing. We use that word um, and sometimes we're genuinely curious where we really don't know the answer, but oftentimes we're, we're curious about when the person we're listening to is going to get on our page <laughs> and actually agree with us. And so that, that exploration, that genuine curiosity is the exact same thing that I did when I was on the road traveling, when I was training to be a wilderness first responder or be a rescue diver, all those things were were explorations of fear, of my discomfort, of comfort, of the unknown. And I do all that same stuff when I'm talking to clients on Zoom now uh, or in their boardrooms. And it's really contextually the same thing. The content's a little different, of course, but, right. but we're really talking about those same fundamental human experiences. Well, and I mean, and that's, the, uh, it, so there's several things that you brought up, like, this is exciting. But I do think that there's a huge difference between that sort of curiosity that is sort of inwardly inwardly focused and then the inquiries that we offer other people come from that place of genuinely, I don't know the answer to your question. I'm just asking it because it seems relevant in this moment. And what do you notice, right? Which is a very different form of curiosity then. So I need you to understand that you're good enough. So- have you ever had an experience and when you recognize that you were good enough um, where I'm really leading you towards a particular idea that I think you need to have? And there's a huge fundamental difference in that. And that's a journey in coaching in and of itself. I mean, I don't know. I can't speak for you. I can speak for myself. I certainly asked those kinds of questions when I first started coaching because Absolutely. I didn't know how to ask the other questions and let go of the knowing and you've been on that journey from beginning coaching to MCC. How did you evolve through that? <laughs> uh, similarly, uh, at the beginning, it was a little, quite a few leading questions, um, questions where I was actually curious about why, you know, the person doesn't see this obvious thing that I see. <laughs> I think that's a, that's a typical, <laughs> <So> obvious, <laughs> <laughs> it's a typical uh, um, early on um, sort of uh, practice that I think coaches do. And, but but that that back to that first conversation I had with that first coach, where he asked me that question, uh, what do you want and why? I had this sort of visceral experience of a truly curious, open-ended question where he was also deeply committed to not letting me off the hook in service of me. I had that experience early on from the other side. And so I had a model for that that I was able to draw upon as I was practicing and fumbling and learning and building muscle as a coach. Um, so my journey started with this very, very high level, high end experience of it. Um, and then as I started to practice it myself, a lot of the, the practice that had me get better at it um, was really to get myself and my needs out of my client's space. 
so that I didn't need them to see what I saw. <laughs> uh, I, I didn't need them to, to get some point I was trying to make. Mm -hmm. I didn't need much from them. In fact, it wasn't about my needs at all. Um, but in, and once I, made, I was able to do that, uh, in building that muscle, being able to do that, um, curiosity was all that really was left. You know, I was able to really get over there, so to speak, and in their in their space, in their mindset, and and get curious about where they might be looking or where they might not be looking, and mm -hmm. why. And I love that question, like what for or why, because it really has people take a look at sort of the foundational uh, underpinnings of what they're doing or not doing or thinking or saying. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and that question I love going back to, oh, what for? What was that about? You know, and really getting curious um, gets triggered for me from that kind of question now. Yeah, yeah, and it it strikes me too just the simplicity of the open ended question also is so powerful because it seems as though it leaves a lot of open space for people to fill in with meaning. And and look at your smile as I say that. I love it. <laughs> what right. just Absolutely. showed up? <laughs> <laughs> well, I noticed that even uh, even in that simplicity, the the shorter the question, typically the the more open ended it is. Uh, all he all that coach asked me on on that day back in 1995 was was why, and then he was just silent because he didn't need anything from me, and it was so evident that it was a gift he was giving me because of how little he was speaking and how much space he left me. And so I'm just smiling because I was, I was remembering that as you were talking. <laughs> well, and I think that speaks to another piece also, which is the use of silence, like ask the simple question and then like, stop talking. I, I th it's a lost art because what it really is, is, is showing somebody that they're being listened to and they're being truly heard when you leave them space like that. And we're not used to that anymore. We have cell phones and, and alerts and we have phones on our watches and we're constantly um, being uh, alerted and told things and delivered data. And there are very few places where we're truly just heard, where we're given a question and then given the space to truly contemplate that question. And that, that might sound simple, but it's not actually easy to do. And it's not easy to be with. I mean, one of the most difficult things as a coach learning in the early stages was to ask a question like that and to just be quiet. Because I feel like I should be doing more and you know yeah. providing more value. But the value is truly in like the, the phrase you use, holding that space to allow the person to simply be with the question they were asked and then to really wrestle with it or or play with it or explore it or just be silent for themselves for a moment that that is uh you know that is actually a gift that you give you can give a client in every moment of a, of a of a coaching call yeah and and i saw as you're talking about the sort of the being with the silence and the kind of the movement of your hand across your chest and it reminds me of how we must learn i say must we must learn to soothe ourselves and that discomfort so that we can allow that gift to be given to the client. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. I love that word soothing too. We, we do have to soothe ourselves and, and soothe that egoic need to, to be heard <laughs> and instead put that down so as to hear. And that's, that's that, you know, a lot of what I work with clients around when I work with them around communication isn't having them be better speakers. That's uh, that's the half of the equation that most people practice is being better at speaking. And, and that's what most people think they're going to get when they are coming to look to become better communicators. What I do is I usually put that aside and have them practice being expert listeners. If you can become an expert listener, that listening tends to inform your speaking and makes that speaking much more powerful and and potent uh, and but but listening is not a, a skill that we're taught as much anymore, right? <laughs> we're not. I mean, we're we're taught to deliver sound bites. I mean, you look at the way um, social media has taught, uh, you know, decades worth of, of of users to communicate is in shorter and shorter and shorter sound bites at people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And 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 all and what we do is we receive, right? We receive that. We we scroll TikTok or or you know, Instagram or whatever it is, and we're just receiving, 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 but we're not actually being heard anymore. And so I think there's a 
there's a lost art in that, but there's also a huge opportunity in it for, for those of us that want to get better at communicating in that way. Yeah. And I mean, I, uh, I just, I just think of how I it just make me sort of wonder how with social media and the kind of the nanosecond, like attention span that we have as a result of scrolling through videos and whatnot, it does make me wonder, like, it is a lost art to listen. And how do we, how would you describe like the benefit for if, if I'm trying to learn this skill set, the benefit for me to actually do it? Not the benefit for you that I do it, but the benefit for me that I do it. I mean, I would assume people ask that kind of wrestle a little bit with like, why am I doing this when everybody else is on audio output only? Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, <clears throat> I think there are a few reasons. Um, mostly it's because listening to someone builds trust and connection and intimacy much more quickly than flinging all you think you know at them. Uh, so if there is an interest in deepening relationship, if there's an interest in, in building connection and longevity in relationship, uh, I think listening becomes one of those key essential skills. So as, as, a, as a listener, I gain that, you know, that, that benefit to the people that I'm listening to, with the people I'm listening to. Uh, but the other thing is that, and, and I spoke to this briefly before, but the better you become at listening, the better you become at speaking. And that's that's not obvious necessarily. It's not necessarily intuitive. But if you think about it, my my ability to listen to what you're asking or saying and listening to what's behind what you're asking and saying and listening to perhaps why you're asking or saying what you're asking or saying, that if I'm listening on those layered levels, then I... I can actually respond in a way that's much more layered and intentional and intimately personal to the conversation that we're having. In other words, I can actually have yeah. the way I respond be a, a bigger reflection of that you were heard than if I was just speaking from what I think I know. And I, I think one of the challenges today is that uh, we're so much in a competition culture for space and uh, and and likes and and hits that there's a lot less of that slowing down that's required to actually hear somebody and leave that space and that's the challenge look i, I you know nothing against social media it's a tool um I, I think the the problem is when it becomes something that's related to as communication in the way that you and i are talking about it well, and I think, yeah, A, and I think there's uh, several things that showed up here, like how, what kind of relationships do you want to have? Yes. Audio output only relationships don't last very long. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, unless so. they're only telling you things that you like and who does that forever, right? Um, right, right. And then I think there's this other piece about if this is, it, it kind of goes into that bigger conversation of like, what do you want? Like, what do you want your life to be like? Forget about the job. Yeah, you want to make money. You want to like your job, blah, 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 all that stuff. But who do you want to be and how do you want to be in the world? Mm -hmm. And without slowing down to even contemplate these things without, and I could never tell you what you need and you yeah. could never tell me what I need. I would hate to limit you with whatever ideas I have about how you should do it and vice versa, right? Like there's a bit of hubris there. I think with listening to the point that I believe you're making, where we can really listen to the words that the other person is saying, we meet them where they're at in a much more human to human connectedness that is genuine. And that I think is so valuable because there isn't enough of that either in the world. Agreed, 100%. I think, I love what you pointed to is that you've got to choose what kind of relationship you want. To your, to your point, you know, audio output isn't wrong if you intend to be a singer, <laughs> if you intend to be an entertainer, if you intend to be a, a radio personality or a TV personality, you know, the people that come to listen to you talk and share your craft. And that's a form of 
uh, you know, of, of communication. Uh, we're talking about a very particular form of communication here, though, where we're talking about uh, coaching uh, and 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 causing a shift for another human being in, in relationship with them, or simply being in relationship with another person, right? That those those that that form of communication requires something else, uh, yeah. something more. And I think that's really the the differentiator. There is that choice. What yeah. what kind of relationship do I want to have with the people I'm speaking with or to? Mm -hmm. And I think you're right. I mean, uh, uh, like you, 100% agree with this because I think if you really are, I, I think there's places for audio output. I think I have a YouTube channel, you know, whatever, right? Like if you want to teach people, teach people and they'll listen. And if they like what you have to say, they'll they'll listen and it'll it get integrated into their kind of way that they're thinking about things. And maybe they've never heard that sort of thought process before. And so it's enlightening. We have how many billions of uh, self-help books out there to prove that people read stuff and they get some little snippet of information from whatever it is that they read that maybe resonates and they hold on to. But to your point, we're talking specifically in coaching and in that, that developmental stage of moving from, let me tell you how to do it to that genuine space of client-led curiosity yeah yeah the analogy that i use um for coaching is uh your bathroom mirror <laughs> i often um share with clients that you know you you look in your bathroom mirror most of us do at least twice a day and you know you flip on that harsh light at the worst time of day and you get right up to a highly reflective surface and you do that because not because you want to see the good news, <laughs> right? <laughs> but because you want to see all the truths that there are to see, which is why you have the harsh light and you're up close and it's highly reflective. The mirror doesn't tell you change that sweater. <laughs> the mirror doesn't tell you what to do. It reflects what's so. And, and the value of this is that we're, it's not just that it does that. It's why we're looking. You know, we're looking because we want to make an informed decision. Now, we're not sitting there thinking about this when we go in the mirror, you know, in the bathroom at 5.30 a.m. or whatever. We're, this isn't the conscious thing. But the truth is what we're doing is we're looking at the harsh realities of what's so as clearly as we can so we can make an informed decision about what to do. I love that analogy. <laughs> I love it because it's true. I've never had the mirror and I wish honestly that it had occasionally told me not to wear that sweater. <laughs> but, I, but I love that analogy because the, it, the mirror, it just, just telling you what is there. It's just, here's just reality. It, this light shows it all. And this is, you know, what you're working with today. Yeah. And this is the way that it's looking to other folks so that we can make an informed decision. Yeah. Yeah. And and I mean, as you think about it from like the work that you do with executives and leaders and C-suite and teams, how do you see, how do you, I'm not sure what the question is exactly, but I think it has to do with how do you hold the space for people who are looking at this primarily from a business perspective and not like my whole life and I'm trying, like, it's not about life coaching. I've got an ROI I have to prove. Right. How yeah. do you how do you work with those folks with this philosophy? Absolutely. Well, the first thing I do with them is debunk this idea that there is this magical place called work that's, you know, siloed from home. <laughs> you know, it's just first of all, let's talk about this this habit or this uh, this mindset and how it's affecting all parts of life. If we simply work with this thing between the walls at work from nine to five. Uh, inevitably, you're going to go home and practice it many more hours. The other thing, many more hours, and it's going to seep right back in. So, got to take a look at this mindset and how it is actually pervasive, and that there's we have to put aside this idea that I only do that at home, or I only do that at work. <laughs> yeah. Somehow, these mindsets, habits, or or um, issues are being practiced everywhere. And we need to take a look at it globally. So I talk about, first of all, when I work with any person, executive, uh, politician, uh, you know, anybody, the idea is, first of all, we got to put aside this idea that there's the work you that we're going to work on and we're going to forget about all the other stuff. We're going to be working with you, the human being, and, and coach that whole human being and the mindsets they bring everywhere. 
And that way you can start to see it everywhere. And if you address it everywhere, it you can change it a lot more quickly. You know, the, the second thing is that, you know, whether you're talking about a ROI from, for a large Fortune 500 company, or you're talking about, you know, your household ROI, <laughs> you're dealing with the same factors in some respect, fear, <laughs> um, resource allocation, um, you know, resistance, teamwork, <laughs> you know, these are all things that, that, that contextually exist in either of those places and all of those places in between. So, you know, we have to obviously tailor that conversation to the clients and the individual's unique experience, but we have to get out of this idea that this is some, you know, special thing that only I'm dealing with. Wait a minute, this is part of the human condition. You have a, or you have a, a, an ROI to hit, um, or you have a, a quarterly numbers to hit, or you have to, to, to do something that, that's been dictated by the board. Um, let's talk about this and let's talk about what's scary about it. Let's talk about your relationship to it. Let's talk about the consequences and your relationship to those consequences. Let's talk about all of it, right? Because you're a human being having to navigate these things. You're not a robot. And and that that usually has people sink back down into their humanity. And once you can sort of be with your humanity and not you know think of yourself as having to be some superhuman, then we can actually talk, start taking a look at What's actually in the way? And if you think about it, my thinking my thinking is that all that mirror really does in the morning is point to what's in the way of you walking out of the house looking the way you want to look. <laughs> and yeah. So, yeah. You know, all I'm doing with any of those clients is reflecting what might be in their way. Hey, you said this and it looks like you're actually doing this. You know, you're, you said A and you're doing purple. Tell me and, more about that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> tell me. I'm curious. <laughs> uh, I'm actually curious because it sounds like you said it and you you don't notice it. And I'm curious about both the discrepancy between, you know, what you said, A, and purple, the thing you actually did. But I'm also curious about what has it not be seen as a discrepancy, right? And this is what, this is sort of part of that, that mindset reflection that people start to mm -hmm. see that, oh, I actually create this cognitive dissonance. I create this, uh, these mm -hmm. blinders. Like, I don't have to look at that. I don't have to look at that. And yeah. and I help them just like that mirror, look at those things that might be in that blind spot for them. Yeah. And, and as you're, as you're talking about that, you know, it's that idea it's first, like you take off hats or it's an outfit or I'm only, I'm only an executive here, but I'm a, I'm a, I don't know, partner parent, whatever child, whatever it is that I am over here, but these things like they don't meet as though we're not a whole human being and wherever we go, we bring ourselves sort of in the famous words of Buckaroo Banzai, wherever you go, there you are. Right. <laughs> <And so. laughs> That's right. And what, what you're doing in one place, you're doing every place typically. In yeah. some way. And what you're yeah. doing in one place, you're doing in every place. And I, and I, I love this, this reflection again, the reflection of the mirror, but also the reflection of the development of self-awareness, because I think based on what I'm, I'm hearing you say, I think there's a place where, where, because of maybe our culture as Americans, and, and I'm making a huge assumption, I think every culture has this, but and especially with social media, there's so much ref like reflection out there at what other people are doing mm. so that I'm making assessments of all of their behaviors and a little less reflection in here because I know why I'm doing what I'm doing. And so I give myself grace, but not you so much, but me totally, like I totally give myself a bunch of grace. Um, but I think there's that sort of like that space at which we have to begin to do that exploration. Oh, how did I, oh, sorry, I need to lower my hand apparently. That was weird. <laughs> um, but I think there's that place where we are learning to be self-reflection, self-reflective and curious on our own behalf. And that's really what I hear you saying. You know, yeah. if you want to be the best sort of leader you want to be, what's in the way of that? If you're, if you've got a purple sweater on, nothing wrong with purple sweaters, but if that isn't how you want to present to the world, then, then what other outfits do you want to play with? Yeah. And you, you know, and to your point and your question a few minutes ago about how I work with those folks in the C-suite and boards of directors and such, the, that conversation is a relational conversation, you know, that somebody is an executive does not mean they relate to themselves as a leader. And that's a relationship. How I relate to myself 
uh, mm -hmm. as a leader or not. Uh, am I a leader? Am I a manager? Am I, you know, wh who am I? Uh, is a question that that folks need to actually answer. They need to be able to articulate for themselves, not, not for me. I help them articulate it, but but they have to be able to say, "Here's who I am," and and that way I get to bring my. Let's say I decide I'm going to be a leader. Now we can talk about what that means, and we can talk about what that means here at work, uh, at home, on the way in between, <laughs> you know, so that I'm practicing being who I say I am. Period, not just where it seems appropriate, and then stopping. <clears throat> so, so that fundamental question, you know, uh, who am I is a relationship question. Uh, you know, am I a leader or not it is a deeply personal and intimate question that somebody needs to answer for themselves. And I think they need to answer it for themselves moment to moment uh, as challenges arise, <clears throat> as conflict, or as the opportunity to not be a leader <laughs> arises. Yeah. Uh, and so it's a deeply um, pervasive question. Uh, that that it has to be answered, but it's relational. It's about how I relate to myself as a leader, how I relate, therefore, to fear. <laughs> how do I relate then to the people I lead? How do I relate to the people I'm led by? How do I relate to the organization I'm leading? Uh, there are all these questions that sort of precipitate from that answer. And, and I think that's that's part of the 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 coaching conversation that stops being about whether I'm a life coach or a leadership coach or an executive coach or a, you know, a relationship coach. You're, you know, as a coach, coaching the person and that person needs to answer these sort of relational questions for themselves, yeah. them and them, uh, and then talk about how they relate to the aspects of what they're doing with themselves yeah. uh, from that respect. Yeah. I've always really, I mean, this really aligns with the the way that I see my own life as well, which is really this idea that uh, the longest relationship I'm ever going to have on this planet is the one that I have with myself. I was there the day I was born. I'll be there into my last breath. And how am I going to be with myself in each of these different situations? Because if I can be the kind of boss who's like always shows up the way that I'm I mean to, but then I get into traffic and I lose my mind and I'm screaming and yelling. And then I get home and I'm super frustrated about how the dishwasher got loaded, right? Like, I mean, there's yep. like all these ways of being. And and how do you have a consistent sense of yourself, alignment with the type of person you want to be in all of these different situations in which we find ourselves? And I think that's the work of a life, right? That's the work of a lifetime. And to your point, it isn't broken into my executive presence and my parental parent presence and my spousal presence or whatever kind of presence it is that I have, but rather how do I show up fully like that each place? And I do it consciously. I think that's the other piece that, that I think I hear you talking about. It's that awareness, right? So I'm recognizing I'm at choice if I'm hearing you correctly. Yes. And it does. And by the way, this doesn't mean that we, we speak the same way in the boardroom that we speak to our children at home. No, please don't. <laughs> right, please don't, right. It does mean, however, that we're responsible, to your point, for being intentional, really intentional about the, the leadership voice that I'm choosing to use here and the leadership voice I'm choosing to use here. That that choosing in and of itself is an act of leadership, right? That, that intentionality is an act of leadership, just being on purpose about my audience, uh, it is an act of being a leader. And if you do that mm -hmm. at your New Year's Eve party and you're also doing that in the boardroom, those are both um, intentional leadership acts. So I think that 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 trying to sort of extricate leadership or extricate your, your life from your work, look, obviously setting boundaries is important. So we're not bringing work home constantly and and and, and not having a, a true life, but we but who we truly most fundamentally and authentically are yeah. needs to stop being negotiated with. I think that's the thing that has to start that, that if I'm, if there's something that I, I work with, especially newer executives around is, is really owning who they are. Hey, who you are, got you here. Let's not, you know, let's not rest back on it, but let's also not try to throw it away and become something else. Let's mm -hmm. actually own this, this part of you that is truly and most authentically you and stop negotiating with it based upon circumstances around you. And I think that that's the thing that leaders bring, the best leaders and the most effective leaders, especially over mm -hmm. time, um, bring to their leadership is that true sort of true north of who they are, even though they're navigating different rooms and circumstances and situations and they're doing so differently. 
Yeah, no, I love that. That's, that's brilliant. And I think, you know, from a coaching perspective for any of the listeners who are coaching, it really becomes the reason why you, you have to learn to really fundamentally listen, going back, circling back to where we sort of started earlier, that, that skill set of listening so that you can be present to what is showing up in the space with the client that you're working with so that you can be curious in a useful way for yes. their benefit. Because I think that's what you even said. It wasn't for his benefit he's asking me this. It was for my benefit that he's asking me this. And so for whose benefit are we asking the question we're asking? Very well said. Very well said. Yeah. And I think it requires us to do all the same work that you're talking about as human beings because it's a scary thing. I mean, most of us are like, great, if we get along and agree, like, oh, Mark, you're amazing. You're brilliant. I agree with you 100%. Like that's, I mean, true and also easy. <laughs> that's right. <fair. laughs> <laughs> and yeah. yet, if, yeah. if it's something where it's like, um, you know, I have a different perspective on that. Like, how are we going to do that well? Yeah. That's the piece that's way more important because how we disagree or how we have like dealing with teams. I want to open door policy with my team. I want them to feel free to come tell me stuff. And then they, damn it, they do. And I don't like what they have to say because they're not telling me how awesome I am. Yes, yes, it's brilliant. How do we, we get sit what we with want. that? That's yeah. right, yeah. How do we deal with conflict? I mean, if you think about it, the, the reason that teams need coaching or need support is because, well, first of all, they're built to get, they're built as a team because they're going to have conflict, right? They're going to actually bring different perspectives and skill sets to each other, and that's going to have conflict. And then how do they navigate that conflict as an asset rather than a problem? And they go too often teams, you know, team members think that things are going well when we don't have any conflict. And that's yeah. quite the opposite. In fact, quite Marriages often. Marriages think in, the same thing. It doesn't right. mean anything good either. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Quite often I'm brought in to work with a team that's got too much group think going on and they like each other. They've been working together for decades and everything's great. And I help them identify, you know, the, the costs of that as well. But mm -hmm. to your point also, you know, that's where you start to really learn about each other as a team when, when there is conflict. And one of the things I like to say to, to, to executives is, you know, when's the last time you didn't get what you wanted, right? I mean, I think a lot of the, a lot of executives in the upper echelons of organizations, at least inside that organization, there's not a lot of people telling them stuff they don't want to hear necessarily, which is why many of them hire a coach. And I'm always curious about who they are when they don't get what they want. Yeah. The emperor has no clothes, right? Like, <laughs> That's right. Fabulous. Um... That's right. Yeah. <laughs> And I like to tell them that, you know, we're going to find out who you really are when you don't get what you want. That's how you tell, uh, you know, sort of aspects and, tra and traits of character uh, yeah. when somebody, you know, it's easy when, when we're getting what we want and things are going well and we're all, everything's hunky-dory. That's easy. And that's not where you really learn much about yourself or other people. Yeah. When you start throwing in, the, in mm -hmm. people being dissatisfied, disagreeing, yeah. uh, disruptive. That's when that can be either related to as an asset and a great thing when navigated effectively, or it can be related to as a problem and everybody just wants to get back to, let's all get back to agreeing, which is equally yeah. to your point, dangerous. Yeah. And and it's so funny too. So when I was, this is a bit back in the day, um, when I was dating in the nineties, um, I remember going out with somebody and one of the things that he said to me, and at the time, you know, I was like 29 or something like that. And he said to me, um, you know, I don't really trust anybody until we've had a disagreement. And at the time, I remember being like, there's so many ways of getting to know people. This is kind of ridiculous that that you would need a disagreement. And the more I sat with it, it was probably within, you know, like over a few months I was sitting with it. And I just started thinking just how pivotally important that is um, mm -hmm. to be able to, how will we have conflict? And I think, and I don't know if this is something that you do, but I think, how are we setting up our agreements on how we'll be with each other when the disagreement shows up so that it isn't blindsiding us? And then we default to our most threatened, fearful selves in order to respond to it, whether it's an over response or shutting down or whatever it is that our pattern of handling because we haven't been self-soothing ourselves through it. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. 
But I think that's all like really important skills for coaches to hold the space for, not teach people how to do. That's what your YouTube channel is for, but to hold the space for, you know, being able to ask, be informed by that curiosity that you're talking about. Yes, that curiosity turned inward almost, right? You know, yeah. Who am I being right now? What got triggered here? What came up? Yeah. Um, you know, and 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 isn't it, it? What's the value in putting myself in situations, environments, relationships, and conversations where mm -hmm. I'm not agreed with? Mm -hmm. I don't. I, you know, I I personally, Mark, don't, don't want to be in rooms with people who disagree with me all the time. That's not interesting anymore. I think okay, it, so I was. disagree with you completely. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> but, but you know, there's no growth. There's no, there's no, there's nothing interesting about it. Um, and, and unfortunately what you're, what you, you see in recent decades is that the information we have access to, we can narrow it to the, the information that we agree with news, data, um, you know, talking points that agree with us, we can limit our feed, so to speak. And I love yeah. that that's called a feed, right? But we can, yeah, I think so. I'm going to go with feed too. <laughs> yeah, we can, we can limit that feed to talking points and opinions that agree with us. This is dangerous. This is problematic. It's creating most, mm -hmm. I would say uh, that's a little bit mu much, but I think it's creating many, if not most of the challenges we face as a, as a, as a world <laughs> full of people yeah. right now. Is that yeah. we sort of gravitate towards what we agree with, and it's easy to do. It's too easy to do, uh, and, and it's comfortable. I think well, and to to your point, I agree with you that I think that that is our you know we start choosing, and I think it's sort of interesting too because I think there's also the reality of cognitive load of just like I don't have the energy for all of these different agree you know thought processes either because right. I'm tired at the end of the day and now you got to put dinner on the table. And I just want to sit there and watch something easy. Yeah. And so I think that that's another piece of it, right? Like it isn't just that, I mean, yes, people's, the algorithms on Facebook and, and all these different social media websites will start to send you all the stuff that it thinks you want to see. So we yeah. get that very narrow perspective. But I also think that it's it's an indicative of also the, just the amazing amount of cognitive load people are struggling with. Absolutely. And, and I don't, I don't think it would be possible even to your point, I don't think it'd even be possible to, to listen to every opinion out there because everybody's got the access to giving theirs. Yeah. But the, the, the challenge I think is when we find ourselves, and this is what I often challenge um, clients and thought leaders around is when you find yourself hooked into a conversation, you feel viscerally, attached to a position that's the one that's ding, ding, ding. the one to go get curious about you know what the other side and those people that are hooked way over there what are yeah. they saying and thinking get curious about what has you hooked what's and this is not where people usually think about this they usually think i'm right and this is the right thing <laughs> mostly what i tell people is get curious about what you're afraid of that has you death gripping this position yeah. And that's not a conversation people like to the first day you get a lot of pushback usually. I'm not afraid. <laughs> yeah. But, it's uncomfortable. It's, it's an uncomfortable. uncomfortable thing to go, what the heck just happened inside of me? Yeah. yeah. And what is that really triggering? It's it's interesting too. I remember this was I was a therapist before I was a coach and and I my husband rode bicycles and there was uh and and motorcycles and stuff like that and so I was very conscious of two wheelers on the road and there were, on this particular day a big old Cadillac was like riding the tail of this little like Vespa and I'm in the car next to it none of my business not bothering me they're fine and I'm having a visceral reaction to it I'm so angry at this big old car that is just tailgating this little Vespa and and they go on their way no problems no accidents it was all fine but I get to my office and I had to lay down and just sort of breathe into like what just happened here um because <laughs> yep. I was so, to your point, those places where we get so hooked, there is gold if we mine there. Yeah. There is gold. Like, what was that all about? And for me, just long story short, it was about another relationship where I was having a boundary issue, where I was letting somebody cross a boundary in ways that were out of alignment to how I wanted to be treated, but also how I wanted to show up in relationships with people. and. And it showed up 
through looking at this little relationship that had nothing to do with me that was happening right outside my driver's window, right? And yeah. I think, I mean, I hope, I mean, there's so much stuff that has been said that I think is really important, but I think what you're pointing to is maybe fundamentally one of the most important things we can do for ourselves is to notice when we get hooked and then what's hooking us. And conversely, what might unhook us? Hmm. Right. Yeah. 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 It's great. It's, it's, it's one of those things that's simple, but really not easy. <laughs> no. And what's not easy about is, it, is, is how confronting it is to look at uh, our own things that we're hooked by mm -hmm. because we're so attuned to being right or wrong. Sort of this binary, you know, and, and if, that, if I'm going to look over here, it means I might be wrong. Right. And and that's something that feels like our 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 existence is at stake at times. Yeah, it's so, an ex existential threat, right? It's absolutely. the existential threat mm -hmm. of maybe I'm wrong. Maybe people won't like me. Maybe my whole worldview is skewed. <laughs> like, yeah. It could be anything, yeah. right? And that can feel incredibly uncomfortable. And I don't think we're really taught to think about that sort of stuff either. I mean, we haven't been, I mean, look, they do a little bit of work with five-year-olds and six-year-olds about how to be nice to each other on the playground and stuff like that. But I don't know that there's enough of it. I mean, I hmm. think, I don't think there's enough training. And then kids spend time at home, but then they, I mean, at school, but then they also spend time at home. And so then you're like I did marriage counseling for 20 years and you see the way people treat each other at home and kids are monkey see monkey do. So it's one of those things that w you see the sort of the patterns continue Absolutely. based on, and this kind of goes back to how are you going to be a leader if you're, when you go home, like you're totally diplomatic at work, you're able to hear differing opinions, you're able to work with your team and do a, just a, bang up fabulous job of how you listen and interact with and then you go home and you're like my way or the highway um it may be a, a disconnect and 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 also not what you're intending to teach yeah what are the what's all the gold in that right what's the thing to be curious about uh, about what i'm protecting uh in one of those places versus the other where i give myself permission and don't um, where I feel powerless and need to wield it like a weapon. Uh, these are these are all such gold ridden questions <laughs> that we so rarely ask because they're so confronting to actually look at. To your point, I think I think it's 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 something though that I think it is the most important um, piece of this is the the exploration and the genuine curiosity of of my positionality of the things that I'm hooked by. Um, but just of my my sort of inner workings, because everything that I do gets filtered through that. Back to that listening and speaking uh, con construct we talked about. Everything I put out there is filtered through what I'm letting in. And if I'm only letting in some things that I agree with, or if I'm only letting in certain experiences to certain places, it's going to affect my output by by just by definition. Yeah, I can't so help it. If, it's limiting in that respect. It's sort of putting a, a, a damper on, on how fast I can go and the number of directions I can go. And yeah. so it's really about it. It's, it's about an opportunity to expand and grow, but even that's a choice, right? I mean, you know, look, I, I also, when I was working in, in corporate America, I, I liked what I was doing because it felt safe. It was, it was, it was clear. It was not, there weren't a lot of deviations. There wasn't a lot of things to be afraid of. Uh, it was, you know, there wasn't a lot of risks to take, uh, especially with my own money. I mean, I, I was really in in, a, in my comfort zone, and that's that's very very persuasive. It's very uh, attractive to feel that safe. And so, what you're talking about is a foundationally uncomfortable thing that someone has to choose to do regularly in order for it to be effective. That's not natural for folks to do. Right. And so, I think that's where we come in, right? And and I think that's where the the act of of coaching comes in because. Uh, even even some of the best athletes in the world who are the masters of their craft have coaches because that coach has a perspective and a vantage point that they can't they don't have just mm -hmm. just you know fundamentally of themselves and so yeah. we need that to help us see the places that we can't see and won't see yeah yeah cuz i mean going back to the mirror 
analogy there there's a lot of i don't know about you but i can go into the bathroom i look in the mirror i know i've looked in the mirror because the mirror takes up like the wall and i am washing my hands at the wall that has a mirror and i can walk out and i can be like did i brush my hair like i won't even remember if i did it or not because i'm looking at myself but i'm looking with that sort of dissociation right yes that's right yeah yeah we get we get um sort of uh narrow focus we get the tunnel vision on what we're doing this is what i'm focused Mm -hmm. on not like anything else yeah Yeah. and i think to your point that's that vantage point is is that in the case of coaching you know the coat the mirror isn't going to tell you what to do or to change that sweater yet it can say hey did you notice that you have green and purple on together um, and so is the, if that's cool, if that's the way you want it to look. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, and the way in which a coach differs from a mirror, of course, is the coach can say, hey, you said this and you're doing this and just want you to see that. And then, you know, here it is again. So not only is there a discrepancy, but there's a pattern of discrepancy that's going unaddressed. Mm-hmm. So what's with the discrepancy and what's with not addressing it when you see it? Yeah. So these are, this is such a rich conversation. It's a very basic example of it, but it's a rich conversation. It's a really good example. And I think it's a place where coaches start to look at, you know, where people have competing commitments, right? They start to look at these ideas of, and instead of telling somebody all about competing commitments, I mean, you can go out and read about that work of competing commitments, but instead you say, you know, I could be wrong, but I'm noticing you're presenting this way, but you're behaving this way. And I'm just curious is it, because maybe this way is the right way to behave in this scenario. And if it's choiceful, great. But if Mm -hmm. it isn't, if it's a pattern that you're unconscious of, Mm -hmm. then what would allow this to become more whatever it is that you need it to be like I don't I mean I don't know what it is that you need to be but (laughs) but but the fact that the coach can see the discrepancy and then just ask a gentle question about Mm -hmm. it not a judgmental one like you're doing this like I don't know maybe I'm just seeing that but that's not what you're doing right um but to have that kind of ability to be a mirror a a compassionate, but also real. Yes. Yes. And then, and then going down into layers of that, right? Because that, that curiosity doesn't have to stop about with, with what's with this discrepancy and the pattern of it, but what's the payoff to this? There's sometimes when something like this is done frequently enough, there's something we're getting out of it. Right. I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're getting some, some benefit to this. Maybe it's managing the expectations of those around us, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, you know, some, like for, for folks who are, who are late, like consistently 10 minutes late to think, what, what are you getting out of that? There's, it's what a great question to think about, right? What am I getting out of being 10 minutes late regularly? The, the first response is typically, well, nothing, that's a terrible thing, right? But there's something in the repetition you wouldn't of it do that's it a benefit for you something. or you wouldn't do it. Yeah. And that's such a rich, so from pure curiosity, you can get down into those layers uh, with somebody and really start to explore questions like that. Like what's yeah. the payoff to this detrimental behavior, which is not the way we think about detrimental behaviors, but it's what's actually going on. I'm getting something out of this, right? Uh, if they know I'm, if they know I'm always 10 minutes late, then I never have to really worry about being on time. Something like that might be the answer. I don't know, but let's get curious about it together. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, it could be anything. To your point, it could be that I don't have to be on time. It could be that people have to wait on me. It could yeah. be that I am over overburdened in my calendar and I am not setting healthy boundaries for myself so that I actually give myself enough time to get where I need to go. And I'm constantly running behind the ball. Um, I mean, it could be any number of things until you ask the question and start to get curious with yourself yeah. about what is motivating this. I mean, and and I think that, and I'm not a person who's typically late. My mother was, and we had this conversation multiple times because I had an hour for lunch and she had as long as she wanted. Um, and so it, <laughs> she'd be like 20 minutes late and I would have started eating, you know, and she'd be like, well, why are you eating? I'm like, well, I got to get that to work. So, you know, like I had a time frame here. 
And I'm like, what do you get out of this? And I don't think that she was getting, like, it wasn't a power trip for her, but it was just a lack of awareness of other people's schedules. You know, she's just sort of, I'm on my own time kind of thing. And, Mm -hmm. and, and there's a benefit to that. That's great. But how does that, how do you want to be in relationship with other people also going back to the thing that you had talked about? Yeah, it could be anything, right? It could be a way of sort of holding on to my freedom by not being on your schedule. It yes. could be anything and like, or attention or whatever, but that, but somebody really looking and figuring that out for themselves. Now it's not just about stopping the behavior. It's actually about exploring what this thing's about. Oh, what has me needing to hold on to my freedom, uh, you know, relative to another human being in that way by, by around, by, lunch. Oh. Around, <laughs> around <laughs> lunch. That's right. Right. What has me not feel free? What, yeah. Where do I feel trapped that I'm rebelling in this way, this really sort of yeah. young way, like a child, like almost a childish yeah. way? What has me doing that? So this is a, a, a this a path, a path that you can take mm-hmm. in that in that exploration that gets so uh, such an opportunity, but gets so interesting also uh, as a coach and and in a coaching relationship. And I think that's that's the stuff that that I you know back to your original question that had me say, wow, I really really want to do what with other people, what that first coach did with me at lunch that day and that one question, um, yeah. because it really is that pulling on that thread. And it felt like that thread unraveled a lot of things for me that I otherwise would have had, uh, uh, you know, everybody else around me colluding with everybody else around me was doing exactly the thing I was doing. And they weren't asking any questions about why not, not any of the people above me, beside me, the people that worked for me, they were all like, yeah, just forward, 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 more, more, more. And I, I didn't even know that there was a question to ask other than that. Right. Yeah. I, I, it was so, it was such a, a, a schism, like such a, a complete shift in even where I was looking. I, I didn't, I remember almost thinking, I don't understand the question <laughs> because it was so, uh, it was so obvious why I was doing this. So, you know, here's what I want and here's why. And that he was like, okay, but why that was something that nobody had even hinted at, at being curious about before that for me. So it was really, that's what fascinates me about this work. Yeah, no, I, 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 I agree with you. It's, it is, again, it really is the work of a life, right? And I think coaching can support people to actually have a life more in alignment with what they want by asking these kinds of questions. I mean, because you could have just as easily discovered the thing that you were passionate about and what you were doing with the insurance or underwriting, right? Like you might've been able to go, this is, you know what? I'm actually passionate about this. Like who knows? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, He would have been been equally happy. If you had, you'd have been somebody else, but some people would be like, yes, this is my passion. That's right. Um, and and so it's not that the question is going to lead you somewhere else. It's just going to lead you into more awareness about why yes. you're choosing what you're choosing. Yes. I love that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I have a final question for you. This has been such a fun conversation. Mm. But as you think about books, thought leaders, people who you would, you know, have influenced who you are and how you show up. Do you have anybody that you recommend to the listeners as somebody you think is important to to pay attention to? And maybe you have more than one, but kind of keep it to two. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's, wow. Uh, there are so many. Um, I, I can share one of the, um, you know, one of the, the, the books that I really like, that I really uh, love and, and first was introduced to as a coach was uh, Tracy Goss wrote a book called The Last Word on Power. And in this book, she describes something called your winning strategy. And it sticks with me now because your winning strategy, the way, and I'm going to paraphrase here, is, is the thing that you use uh, to, to succeed, the thing you've always used, like hard work <laughs> to get where you are. Um, and when back into a corner, it's the thing you rely on but isn't necessarily serving you anymore. It's not necessarily serving you in certain places you're playing and certain things you're trying to do. Uh, so it's that old hammer, you know, it was great w- with a nail, but then you had to go to open a window. So the idea of that really stuck with me. And I was thinking, well, what are my winning strategies? Hard work had always been my winning strategy. 
but it didn't work so well in relationship. <laughs> the way I was doing hard work was just sort of like, you know, the hammer. And, and that doesn't work in relationships so well. So I had to unlearn a number of things. And that stuck with me as a an influential conversation, an influential insight and, and understanding of the way that the things that help us succeed don't always serve us to just always rely on sort of habitually. Yeah, that's, yeah, that is, again, the fundamental work of a lifetime, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like the thing that got you here may not get you there. <laughs> They're there. <laughs> that's right. Yes. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. Gosh, Mark, this has been so much fun having this conversation with you today. Thank you. It's been so wonderful being here. I loved your questions. This has been great. Thank you. I have really appreciated having you on the show too. Thank you so much for being on the coaching studio.